Parents of Reddit, what is the creepiest thing your young child has ever said to you? My father tells me this story of my childhood every once in a while. When I was around six years old, my dad's best friend committed suicide. We'll call him Joe for the sake of the story. Obviously, it was a very rough and emotional time for my dad. Joe was my dad's best man at his wedding, the one guy who was always there for him. After my dad got married, he and my mother left Joe in the town they were in to start a life outside of the town they grew up in. After years of moving around California, my family eventually moved to Utah, where my father worked for a successful internet business. Joe stayed behind in Washington. Because my family were so far away from their old life with Joe, there wasn't a lot of foresight slash warning that Joe intended on ending his own life. Joe's sister apparently had been blaming Joe's wife for her brother's suicide. Joe and his wife drank a lot of booze, and probably as a result, fought a lot. My father always said that they were a passionate couple, yes, they would fight often, but he hardly knew two other individuals who were so completely in love. For this reason, he didn't believe it. A few days after Joe committed suicide, his widow called up my father sobbing about how she thought it was her fault. After about an hour of trying to console her, he told her if there was a way for me to talk to Joe now, I guarantee you that he would tell you that he loved you, and that it wasn't your fault that he ended his life. Crying, she still didn't believe him, but she thanked him for the kind words and let my father go. My dad was obviously distraught after that long, hysteric conversation. He had been down in his office for a while, and he decided to come up and check on his kids while making a pot of coffee to take his mind off of things. We were all supposed to be napping, but he thought he'd peek his head into our rooms to make sure we were safe slash maybe try to have a little smile or brightness added to his day. Sure enough, when my dad got to my room, I was fast asleep on my bed. He went to my brother's room, and he was also sleeping. Finally, he checks on my sister, who is sleeping as smugly as an angel. He decides to go back towards my room and into the kitchen to make some coffee. As he walks by my room, he notices a whimper. He turns around, and enters my room, where he finds me weeping. I was five years old, so the way I was crying seemed odd to him. Normally a five-year-old would cry drastically over dramatically. I wasn't. I was just sitting on the side of my bed, weeping. My dad enters my room and says Maddie, what's up? Why are you crying? It's then that I stop crying for a moment, look up at him with teary eyes and say Rick, it's not her fault. I love her. It's not her fault. With that, I stopped crying, rolled over back onto my bed, and fell swiftly back to sleep. Around age 3 to 4 I started telling my parents about my other family. One of my older siblings had imaginary friends from the same age, so at first they thought it was the same deal, as I was talking about a little girl. Now this carried on, mostly overlooked for a period of weeks, until I started including a man and woman in my conversations. It was then that my mother twigged that when I had talked about my imaginary girlfriend, it was always things we had done. Past tense. With my sibling, and with a lot of children who have imaginary friends, the imaginary person is present, and everything is present tense. This, combined with the introduction of the man and woman, soon to be revealed as my other mother and father, made my parents take a second look at what I was telling them. Having spent a few weeks generally looking past my imaginary compadres, they started to ask me questions. Asking me for the first time, who are you talking about? I looked at my mother and said with what my mother describes as a level of seriousness inappropriate for a child, my other family. I had a ream of stories to go with my other family. One that stood out to my father took place when he took me to the beach the first time. When we got there he asked me was I excited to see the sea for the first time. I wasn't, because apparently I had been there already with my other family. I was totally unimpressed and my poor dad was flabbergasted, four hour round trip from our home to the beach, and severely creeped out at my deathly serious attitude to what should have been a pretty cool day out. This wasn't a little kid being grumpy or difficult, this was a complete night and day change in personality and humor which would always be tied back to my other family, and the things I had done with them. With plenty of more instances of my other family being brought up, my parents sat me down in the pantry turned playroom and talked to be directly about what the hell I was talking about. Up to this point, I would apparently just become quiet when they asked me questions. This time was different. They asked me could I see my other daddy, or mommy, or sister. I answered no. They asked me had they ever been here, in the family home, and I said no. They asked where did I see them, and when did I see them. I answered with a whisper, before, then plopped down off the chair and went back to playing with my Legos. Sitting with my back to them, my father asked me, 
where did they go, get your dienst? My answer, with arm actions to complement it, was down. Down into the hole in the ground. So my parents are sitting there with their four-year-old child, who is now talking about having been at the funeral of his other family. The conversation stops. I go back to my Legos. My parents look at each other. My dad loads the next question, where did they go down into a hole? My answer, granddad's house. My dad got the car keys, and into the car we went. Destination, granddad's. Objective, get some answers about the creepy kid's story. Now it turned out I wasn't talking about granddad's house, but rather a graveyard, maybe 10 minutes drive from my granddad's house, somewhere they had never taken me, somewhere my grandfather swore he never took me, he looked after me on weekends sometimes, and given that I was never out of my granddad's sight, somewhere I could never have been by myself. Regardless, I took my mother, father, and grandfather to this graveyard, and with no hesitation brought them to about three quarters of the way back, right up to a weather-beaten limestone grave marker, pointed to the ground in front of it, looked at the trio of horrified adults and said in there. After this, I never brought up my other family again, and my parents avoided bringing it up until I was in my early teens, with a do you remember doing this? Line of questioning. Note, the graveyard was designated as burial ground in the 1200s according to the local history I've read since. So there's everything from famine victims to World War I vets buried there. Aside from the World War vets, there wasn't a burial there since the 1800s. P.S. I also had a habit as a child of pointing out dead family members in old photographs by name, who I had never met or been shown before. I could do this because apparently I had seen them around the house. I was a freaky child. Not a parent, but my brother was born when I was around 14. One night a few years ago when he was 4 or 5 or so, I was watching him for my parents so they could go to some sort of thing. I forget what. Anyway, my brother for no reason ran out the back door into the backyard, and I brought him back inside, he insisted our dad was out there and that he needed to talk to him. I told him that our parents were far away, but he insisted our dad was out there. I even called to prove that he wasn't out there, he told my brother he wasn't there, but he insisted that he was out in the backyard, and that he had seen him there, and was just screaming and being a real shit of a kid, trying to run out the back door. I had to physically restrain him the best I could to prevent him from running out into the dark. Anyway, I looked out all the windows in the entire house to see if I could see anyone out there, and I saw nothing. My night vision is awful, but still, I think I might have noticed something if someone was walking around out there. I finally got him calmed down, then about a half hour later, when I went to use the bathroom, he started insisting our dad was out there again, and said he could hear him yelling for him from outside. I heard nothing. But I looked out the windows again, and noticed that in the front yard there was a styrofoam cup sitting upright near the porch that wasn't there earlier, and it was pulsing with red light. No, nothing too mysterious, it looked like some sort of red LED was in the bottom of it. It was odd. I wanted to go have a look at it, but couldn't get him to stop flipping out. Anyway, about an hour later I looked out the window again because I heard something outside, no idea what, nothing too suspicious though. Odd thing, there were two more glowing LED things. I could see smallish devices of some kind, it looked just big enough for maybe two AA batteries in the LED, but these were sitting in the grass, the one in the cup was still there. Still no idea where they came from, still unable to go out and see what these things were. Anyway, later my brother insisted he saw a red dot light on the wall shining through a crack in the curtains. It sounded like he was describing a laser pointer. Again, could see no one outside. Anyway, I looked out the window on occasion to see if I could see anyone doing anything with those odd red LED things or anyone with a laser, but nope, nothing. When my parents got home later, I checked out the window again, the glowing LED things were all gone, including the cup, and I asked them if they saw anything like it, they insisted they hadn't and said a kid most likely dropped a toy or something and came back for it. But I really doubt it. It was all quite creepy and odd. Have a younger brother who had an imaginary friend when he was younger. He was also an avid sleepwalker. When he was around three or four, he started talking to someone he called Freya, Freya. He described Freya as a dark-skinned man with little clothes who loved to hunt in the wilderness. Then one day he told me that Freya used to live nearby the house a long time ago. And then some white people came and burned him alive and killed his village. Not exactly something you expect to hear from a four-year-old. I remember I would be in my room and, and hear him talking like he was having a conversation and when I would try to check on him, he would immediately become silent and turn his head as soon as I peeked around the corner. 
very unsettling. While my other brother, the middle child, was visiting his dad for the summer but the day before he got back, my youngest brother told my mother and I that Freya does not like when, brother, is mean to me. He's going to scare him. The night he got home, my mom and I were downstairs and heard a scream that I can still hear to this day. We ran upstairs and found the middle brother swearing that someone was shaking his bed violently. It was a bunk bed. My youngest brother was sound asleep. A month later, my youngest brother took a bad fall and cracked his skull. He was fine, but never talked to Freya again after that. He would also sleepwalk constantly. And show up right next to my bed and stare at me until I woke up and promptly shit myself. One night I heard my front door open and close. Since it was 4am, I went to check it out. I opened the door and found my brother at the far end of the yard, in the snow, only in his underwear, staring right at me. Then he slowly waved. Those shivers weren't from the cold. I don't have kids of my own yet, but my little brother did something that creeps me out to this day. He was around three when it happened. My mom called me from my room to grab her a towel so that she could keep an eye on both of my little brothers that were playing in the tub. I had grabbed the towel and was just walking into the bathroom when my three-year-old brother, who normally had that adorable broken little kid speech suddenly sat up straight in the tub, cocked his head and said in the most serious pronunciated voice look mom, I can't die. He had crossed his arms over his chest and slid underwater. It took a second for me and my mom to react, but she pulled him out pretty quick. He had inhaled a bunch of water and was crying, but he was okay. So fast forward a couple of years, we were replacing the trim in my little brother's room that was adjacent to the bathroom. We were tearing down the trim in their closet that adjoined to my parents' room, and we found an old penciled height chart on the wall where the trim was. There was only one kid named Alan, and the height chart stopped at the age of five. The old lady that had owned the house before us had sold it to us so she could help take care of her husband in an assisted living home. She had mentioned on more than one occasion that they were the first owners of the house and had never had kids. So we did some some research, and, thanks to the public library's amazing newspaper archive, found an article from the 1950s stating that the old couple had, indeed, had a kid. He had drowned in the tub in the same bathroom my little brother had his episode in. The conclusion in the paper followed somewhere along the lines that his mom wasn't supervising him in the bathroom when he had stood up in the tub, slipped, and hit his head his name was Alan. I refused to even go in my parents' bathroom after that. When I started school my parents bought this sprawling apartment in the suburbs of the city we had moved to from a poting town. It was all very exciting for me as I was five and my brother was two. The only thing that my dad's friends disapproved of was that the rear windows of the apartment opened to an old graveyard with an scattered overgrowth of eucalyptus trees. I loved the new school and the everything about the place. Mom soon got pretty blinds to cover the window as my lil bro was getting too curious. Otherwise it was a nice locality. Few neighbors only because most got freaked by the proximity of the building to the graveyards. Kids used to play in the park in the front. And there was a watchman who used to keep an eye on the kids as they played and patrol the streets below at nights. We spent some good four years there before my dad got a better job in another city and the house was sold off to pay for a new one there. It was the best time for the family. Happy and stress-free. Now my parents often narrate our childhood tales from when we lived there in family functions or just on the kitchen table for a few laughs. I was often at the butt of my dad's jokes who teased me about my pretend friends. One day he was teasing me about the old woman friend I had, that one talking teddy bear friend I had. I told him how I don't remember any of those. He told me how my book obsession lead me to believe there was a guardian for me everywhere. Like that watchman, he chuckled out of the blue. The watchman was real dad, parents laughed at me. Sure, honey, he said. Your descriptions of him were detailed. And he often kept you from venturing out of the area into the streets. You used to get candies from the neighborhood kids, but you used to tell us the watchman gave them to you. I was flabbergasted. I distinctly remembered the watchman. He wore khaki overalls and carried a cane. He had pock marks on his face but he wore a big friendly smile under his grey thick mustache. He was nice. Never talked much but always told me that mom and dad love you. You should love your brother he'll take care of you when he grows up. I told my dad this. He laughed some more. So then I told him that one day when mom had lost the house keys and we were planning to stay at my aunt's place till he got the lock fixed, it was the watchman who'd given me the lost keys. Dad had to pick me up from the bus stop to my aunt's place and then get the lock fixed. He had met me as soon as I had gotten off the school bus given me the keys and asked me to wait for dad. I had held his hand and waited until my flustered dad came 10 minutes later and saw me waiting alone. 
Apparently, there was no one one waiting with me. My parents had thought I had miraculously found the keys. I had. I remember the day crystal clear in my head. Mr. Watchman gave the keys to me. His hands were warm. And he had a black mole on his knuckle that I remember staring at and calling it a bug. I swear he was real. Recently, my dad's friend's kid lived in an apartment in the same building when he started college. He boarded the rear windows as he was really scared. Later he told my brother that he'd seen a weird dude in overalls walking to and fro across the lane and all around the park in front a few times at night when he smoked out in the balcony. Creepy man, that one. Stares at you and doesn't look away for minutes. ATL East he believed me after that. Creepy shit. Adding to the creepy. My dad grew up spending most weekends and afternoons after school with his grandmother, my great-grandmother, in a big old house in Southern California. She died only a few weeks after the house was sold in the early 60s, before she'd gotten settled anywhere else. When I was about 12, more than 30 years later, we happened to be visiting friends in the area, and my dad looked up the current owners to see if they'd mind us stopping by. Turns out their parents had bought the house from my great-grandma and they were very happy to have us stop by. As we wandered around, my dad commenting on the things that were the same and the things that were different, the woman, who was very friendly and warm, started looking at us very oddly. Finally she just couldn't help herself, and she said, look, I know this is strange, but… And she began telling us all of these things. Every radio in the house, no matter what, will only play my grandmother's favorite classical music station. Ever. Nearly every time they left the house, they'd come home to find it on. Everything they planted in the flower box next to the kitchen window will die, and though they'd replaced the soil several times, poppies grew there every time, without fail, and flower all year round. Guess what my grandma's favorite flowers were? She always had poppies in that box. Frequently their kids would talk about the nice old lady in the sunroom, my great-grandma's favorite room. Several times the woman talking to us was positive she had heard an old woman singing in that room, something she used to do in the late afternoon as my dad played and she sewed. Just then, their six-year-old son came home from school, saw me, and ran up to me, beaming. Have you come to visit the old lady? She'll be so happy, she talks about you all the time. Then he turned to my dad, and here's the kicker. He knew my dad's name. I literally creep myself out with this once or twice a month at work to pass the time, and I've been debating whether or not to post something, clearly the time has come. Backstory my dad passed away when I was 10 in a car accident. My great-grandmother, a devout Catholic, and my cousin not so devout passed away within weeks of one another. My Gigi died of pneumonia, and my cousin in a car accident. When my son was just an infant, 9 to 10 months, he would pull himself up in his crib, cooing and smiling at a picture of my cousin, not weird, babies like faces. As he got older he started talking to the picture, at least I thought it was the picture. When he was about 3, he came storming out of his room one night and demanded that I make that man shut up. When I asked which man he was talking about he said you know, Dustin. With the red hair. The man in the picture. He visits me at night, but I'm really tired and I want to sleep. Make him be quiet mom. Please. We hadn't talked about Dustin to my son at this point, so I'm a little nerved out that my three-year-old knows his name. About a year later we're putting him into his booster seat and my aunt turned the car on fast forward to him screaming bloody murder don't turn the car on till I'm buckled. Don't do it, please don't do it. I don't want to get crunched. I asked what he was meant by crunched and he said that's how my babu died. He was crunched by the car that night. I asked who babu was and he said it was his grandpa. Googled it later, babu means grandpa in Swahili. My dad was from Nigeria and spoke Swahili and, sadly, was most certainly crunched by his car at night, 13 years before this little incident. Lastly, a couple weeks ago my aunt was driving him home from the movies and he started crying, saying he didn't want his Gigi to die. He said her heart hurts and she's gonna die if they can't help her. While this is happening in the car, I'm at Gigi's house reading an EKG over the shoulder of the paramedic testing my grandma. She was sitting in her chair and all of a sudden went really pale and said her chest was hurting. So I called 911, my son gets home while they're loading her into the ambulance and demands to go to the hospital with her. So we all hop in the car buckled in of course and head to the hospital. After a few hours and a couple tests the doctor tell her she's going to be okay, to which she says oh thank heaven, I knew mom was watching out for me. My six year old pipes up with I wouldn't count on that gg. Elenior is in hell with the rest of the hypocrites. Elenior would be the devout catholic great grandma that he's never met, 
and whose name he's never heard. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more.